Throughout history, we've seen that evil is a force to be reckoned with. And with our social climate and the turmoil that it's in these days, with macro situations like Paris, Orlando, Oaxaca, natural disasters, wars, human trafficking, the uneasy political climate we're in, down to the micro events like domestic violence, car accidents, or someone's loss in the battle with cancer. Those poignant questions continue to ring out in the minds of many. Where is God in all of this? How can a good God allow all this evil to happen? Is this all God's will? Today we're going to take a moment to reflect on questions such as these and the problem of evil, but we're going to do it by way of reflecting on the genius of Jesus Christ. At some point, God decided to create a world and probably an entire universe in which free will is cherished and true love can exist. That's the kind of world we live in. When we look around and we see our own agency, when we see the things that happen, we see what's going on, it's pretty evident that there's such a thing as free will. And then God decided to create humanity in his own image with the capacity to influence for good or evil because of free will. We have been given the gifts of agency, autonomy, influence, sovereignty, creativity, independence, choice, free will, thought, intelligence, relationship, and the ability to know both good and evil. It even appears that angelic beings were created with that type of similar agency, since some of them chose to rebel against God. So to truly be free is to truly be able to choose between good and evil. After God created us, he shared that our purpose was to be fruitful and multiply, to give new life both figuratively, through creativity, such as in the arts, our work with our hands, and literally, through birth. But note that even in the creation story itself, God never indicated that worship was a purpose or a mandate, a demand. The purpose that he shares was creativity and relationship, which of course can include worship as a natural response. So from the beginning, we were created to be free with agency, free to live as we choose, free to work together with one another and with God, or to choose to separate ourselves from one another and God. At various points throughout history, humanity has chosen to do things that have brought evil consequences into the world, either through evil intent or with a misguided or misused good intent. We really haven't ever had a handle on the whole good and evil thing, have we? <laughs> Only God does that really well. At various points throughout each of our own individual lives as well, we all make choices that at times have evil consequences, again, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. Oftentimes because we desire agency, the ability to act and, and have influence, without the responsibility and accountability that really should come with it. You can't have one without the other. But what is evil exactly? Here's the definition that I'm working from today. That which brings harm, death, detrimental separation, breakage in relationship, fear, mistrust, deprecation of self and others, mistreatment of self and others, and oppression. That's evil. And the moment that our Creator decided to create a world, a universe like ours, He was faced with the question of what to do if the beings that He gave this type of agency to decided to choose evil. How would, could, He help them understand and freely choose of their own accord to live in goodness, peace, love, grace, etc.? He decided to create a system which could fight back itself. Think of your own immune system. 
on a daily basis, unfathomable amounts of toxins go through our body, things we don't even know about, and yet our immune system fights them off. Otherwise, we'd be sick a lot more than we often are, even though we do succumb to it at times. So think of that as a microcosm, a small iteration, a sample of the world, the universe at large, like a big, giant immune system that God created that fights back against evil itself. The system of relationship that he had created, although it was capable of breaking down, and we see it every day, was even more capable of overcoming that breakdown and becoming something even stronger and more meaningful in the process. Thus began the journey of relationship that we've seen and read about throughout history and in the Bible itself. Let's take a look at that journey. God has tried to help us understand that there is but one who is wholly good and who truly knows the path to meaningful living, who truly understands that difference between good and evil. Look at the early days of God's journey in walking with people like Noah or Abraham, Moses, the early days of the children of Israel. And then you have Israel's desire to have a human king and the battle that God faced with them in that, trying to help them understand that that wasn't necessarily the best idea, and yet he worked together with them through that process. The constant dilemma of false gods that people like the children of Israel have struggled with throughout the ages in terms of who do we worship, how do we worship, what do we worship? The coming of Jesus himself to show us the clearest way possible that God is indeed good and to show us the actual path to meaningful living by his example. He gave us the clearest understanding of good and evil and he gave us the clearest picture of who he and God really is. He showed us that the goodness that you are choosing, that we are choosing, the one who loves so much and embodies goodness so much that he would live among us and even allow himself to be subject to the evil perpetuated by the people he created, that one is truly good. And that one is the only way. He is the only way. And then look at the spread of the testimony of Jesus through his followers after he left. A great testimony by Michael this morning in terms of what it means to leave an influence behind. And even when you're gone, to have people say, we choose to do this in honor of you. That's what we get to do every day. And that's what Jesus' followers did when he left. Jesus, you're gone, but we're doing this to honor you. The continuing battle against the darkness of evil by people who uphold goodness in God's character. People like the Reformers. People like Martin Luther King Jr. and those who fight for equality and mutual respect. People like Mother Teresa and those who care for oppressed peoples, the poor, the needy. Throughout the ages, we can see that no one ever really quite got it. Agreed? We, never, we still don't really quite get it. But Jesus is always the key, and so let's take a quick and closer look at a snippet from his life that can maybe help us understand a little bit how God and Jesus interact with humanity and creation. We're going to take a look at the temptations. Three moments in Jesus' early walk when he faced Satan himself. We know what those are. Satan tells him, you know, you're hungry. You've been out here a long time. You know, your, your journey back is still quite a ways. What are you going to do? Aren't you famished? Jesus says, well, yeah. He said, well, turn these stones into bread. Feed yourself. I mean, why are you making yourself suffer so much? Ease your own suffering. Then he talks about the temple. And they start to get into this discussion about, as I imagine it, how Jesus might draw people to himself. And he says, well, how are you going to accomplish that? I mean, th th these people don't even want you. They they've been rebelling against you this, this whole time. You know, wh well, what if you went up to the top of the temple where, you know, your father dwells and you jump down and, 
and your angels came around you and, and you safely landed and you landed in the midst of all the priests and the people there and that would be great. They would flock to you. They would say, wow, this is the Messiah. This is the one. Let's worship him. And then three gets a little desperate. Says, forget it. I give it back to you. You can have this place. You can have it. You can have this world. I give it up. Just bow to me really quick. We'll call it even. And we'll part friends. We'll give up this battle. Satan and Jesus debated on how God should best relate to humanity and creation. That's what it was all about. Satan proposed the use of power for self-preservation and self-gain. Also quick and forced coercion in worship. In essence, that which would result in continued evil, separation, and discord. While a few might benefit and gain, it doesn't benefit and gain everyone in a truly godly fashion. But Jesus resisted and chose selflessness, patience, free will, love, grace, humility, service. In essence, all that which would result in continued goodness and meaningful growth for all. A powerful moment in the life of Christ to decide how am I going to continue relating to these people and to this world and to this universe that I created despite the fact that they continue just not to get it, despite the fact that there's so much evil in the world, despite the fact that they perpetuate so much evil in the world, that they don't choose me, that they don't understand what truly is meaningful and goodness, how am I going to continue to relate to them? So how does God and Jesus interact with humanity and creation? Let's take a look at these principles here. God does not interact for self-preservation and self-gain. He never has, and he never will. Every moment that we see clearly in Christ's life and throughout other portions of Scripture, we see that God has always acted selflessly. Life's true meaning is more than self-preservation and self-gain. There is only one true God out there that has the best interest of creation at heart. You can look, I dare you, anywhere else, at anything else, at anyone else, and you just won't find the same degree of beauty and meaning as you will find in Jesus Christ and the one true God. If you know of one, let's talk about it, but I doubt you'll find one. It's taken us this long, and we still haven't found one, so I'm pretty sure there isn't. God does not force, coerce, threaten, or manipulate. We see that in the temptations. We see that in, in Jesus' life. He does not interact with us in that way. It's about free will. It's about free choice. It's about us choosing whatever we choose of our free will, and hopefully we choose his goodness. God does not seek to control creation at whim, nor can God be controlled by creation, ourselves included, at whim. We can, however, work together with him to make a difference. Sometimes we do get stuck on the idea of God or Christ as a genie, or as a magician, or as a giver of everything we demand and want. And we do get frustrated when that doesn't happen. But God is not to be controlled, is not to be manipulated, is not to be a production of our magic abilities. He is somebody to relate to, to be in relationship with, and to work together with. God does not take the path of least resistance and is willing to serve and even die for the good of all creation. Jesus was given the opportunity to take the path of least resistance quite a few times in his ministry, even up to the last moment, and he didn't choose it. God works together in harmony with humanity and all of creation. There is a relationship of interdependence that God has chosen to live within, to limit himself to, actually. 
and to bestow upon creation. Jesus himself embodies this principle in his integration of divinity and humanity. Jesus' ministry was a balance of reaching out in humanity, things like teaching, caring, living by example, loving, dying, getting down on his hands and knees, and his divinity, healing, resurrecting, miracles, the grace and forgiveness he showed. And Jesus connected with all people equally. Rich, poor, powerful, oppressed, tax collectors, prostitutes, religious leaders, criminals, fishermen, widows, politicians, lepers, you name it. He loved them the same. Jesus chose followers from all walks of life. All walks of life. And he sent them out. Thus, what does that mean for us today? He was able to reach people from all walks of life. His followers were able to, to reach people of all walks of life. The tax collectors could reach the tax collectors. The prostitutes could reach the prostitutes. The fishermen could reach the fishermen. The women could reach the women. The men, the men. The kids, the kids. You name it. Nobody was left out. Who would Jesus choose today? Would he, does he, not reach out in the same holistic way? Does he not reach out to each and every one of us here today and each and every one of the people that are out there? Every single one. You better believe it. Nobody's left out. So throughout the history of God relating to humanity, we see one recurring theme. And Michael mentioned it. We are to be the salt and the light. It is humanity and creation in relationship with God, Jesus, and his Holy Spirit that brings meaningful change into the world today. And it always has. We are the embodiment of the genius of Jesus Christ. Jesus overcame evil and has shown us that we have the opportunity to do so alongside of him. Because of Jesus, we know that God is love and that we have been given the chance to be the answer to the problem of evil. So you want the answer to the problem of evil? Look in the mirror. You are the answer to the problem of evil. Each and every one of us. Because we were created in God's image and he created us to be the answer to the problem of evil. To be the answer of good. We have a hope and a promise that we can make a difference today and that one day Jesus will return to make all things new so that we can continue to live in his goodness without the stain of evil. It's not going to be super terribly different when Jesus comes back. We're still going to love in a meaningful way, but without the stain of sin. And it's going to be that much more beautiful. But today, we can start living what we believe tomorrow will bring. How are we living out our relationship with God, given these principles? Do we find ourselves asking God to make these stones bread? When we're famished, literally or figuratively speaking, do we ask for the easy out? God, just... Make these stones bread. Quick. Sustenance. Self-serving gain and preservation. Are we asking God to make others love, accept, and follow him? Or our version of him? You know, how come they don't believe like I believe? Or, you know, how come they don't love you, God, you know, just, just make them love you or, or make them treat me with respect or make them stop having tattoos and piercings or make them not be gay or, you know, all these things. Just make them fit into this box that, that my mind fits into. Are we choosing to separate ourselves from God and others to achieve self-preservation and self-gain? Do we look down upon others? Do we look up in terms of our own abilities and our own self-worth? 
Do we cause division through oppression, through failing to act when we have the ability to act, to help others, to empower others, to lift others up, to make a difference for good and for positivity in this world? Do we cause separation? Do we choose that? Do we blame God for evil, shaking our fists angrily because we feel that he's failed to act or waiting around passively for him to make it all go away? When will you come back, Jesus, and make it all better? Or, damn it, God, why, why can't you just you know, stop all these bad things from happening? And we just sit there. And he looks at us and he says, what about you, my son? What about you, my daughter? I've created you with the ability to make it better. Hopefully we're not doing any of those things. Hopefully we are living out the genius of Jesus because that's what he's created in each and every one of us. That's the spark that he left behind when he left. That's his Holy Spirit that dwells among us. The ability to live out his character, the ability to love, the ability to forgive, the ability to be like Christ. Not power, not miracles, not the power to raise people from the dead, but the power to make a difference because we love. So here's some principles for how we can live that out today. Don't worry about how you're going to survive and succeed. God provides, right? He knows the hairs on our head. He knows the sparrow. He knows what we need. He knows we have to eat to survive. He knows we even need money from time to time. He knows. He's created a world which provides. You know, if we don't have food to eat, we could probably find a berry tree and pick them off and eat them. But even better than that, we could go to one of our brothers or sisters and say, I'm in need. And our brothers and sisters can say, what do you need? Let's get it done. That's a beautiful thing. Instead, focus on living a godly life that takes its sustenance from the goodness of Jesus Christ and work together to make life meaningful for all people, not just yourself, not just for your own, and then all will be provided for. As a church family, we should never have people in want because we should always be working together to provide. Now, that doesn't mean we could take advantage of each other either. But if we're all working together in the Spirit of Christ, that won't happen. Don't focus on temporal success and control. Instead, live out humility and service and work for the greater good of all. Empower others and uphold free will. It's not about controlling people or making them like you. It's not about controlling all the circumstances of this world. It's not about finding, like the song said, all the things of this world that fail to satisfy. It's about finding meaning in Jesus Christ. It's about finding meaning in the security of the community of Christ's followers and the love that we can share with one another. Don't force God and others into a box of our own making and perception. Don't criticize, judge, or condemn those who are different from you. True relationship happens organically. We see that every day with God, we can, in this very instant, say, God, forget you. And he won't strike you down. And some of us it may have had moments where we walk away from God at times, but we're still here because he still loves you and he still knows our potential for good. And he wants us to experience that, to be one with him. It happens organically. It happens in its proper time, in our free choosing. So we need to treat each other in the same manner. If God doesn't force that upon us, we can't force it on each other. Let it grow in its own time. Instead, focus on being an example for Christ-like love, grace, kindness, compassion, and respect. People will naturally gravitate towards you and see the value of Jesus and then desire that for themselves, desire to know that personally. If people don't respond, well, you can keep loving and then shake the dust off of your sandals and move forward. Jesus himself said that was fine. But we don't stop loving. 
We just keep moving forward. Don't allow separation and division to seep in. Instead, be open to the ways that Christ is working in, through, and with all people. Remember the example of Jesus and his diverse band of followers. Jesus welcomes all to sit at his feet and decide for themselves. Jesus said, you know, even though if these people here wouldn't speak for me, the rocks would. So next time you see somebody who doesn't quite meet your standard or perception of what you think might be a speaker for Christ, think twice. Don't take the path of least resistance. There is no easy path in living a truly meaningful and Christ-like life. Instead, make life decisions each day that build up your relationships with others and God in a positive, meaningful, and Christ-like way. Show love, forgiveness, grace, patience, compassion to all around you. The process and journey are just as, if not more, important as the end result. And shortcuts lead to short-lasting results. The arduous, self-sacrificing journey leads to meaningful and lasting life change because the faithful nature of your character will be revealed. It might seem like it's taken a long time, but it's worth it. Don't give up. Don't live a passive life expecting God to bring about all the goodness and change this world still needs. Instead, work actively together with Christ to fight evil and make a difference. We have been created in God's image, given gifts and talents, and we have the testimony of Jesus and his Holy Spirit. Jesus even told his followers that they would do greater things than he did. What do you make of that? We know what has true meaning and value because of Jesus Christ and the testimony we find in Scripture. We know what love and grace are. We know the difference between good and evil. Let us live today what we believe tomorrow will bring. Let us follow Jesus and embrace his genius, the system that he has created, this world, this universe, our agency, his image, his character. Don't blame God or demand his intervention when evil rears its ugly head. We are the ones who choose it or fail to stand against it. Evil is not to be blamed upon God. We cannot say, why God? Why all this evil? Why did you allow this? Without first asking, why do we choose or allow this evil to happen? Instead, stay the course, be faithful, and keep living out the love and grace of Jesus. That's what we can do. God desires and works for good no matter what we think of him or what we think of his ways the little that we know of them. And he created us with the ability to do the same. When we keep shining the example of Jesus in the midst of evil circumstances, evil does not hold sway. Goodness can be found in spite of and in the midst of those circumstances. And there's hope for new growth. We've had a lot of fires recently, haven't we? Unfortunately. But thank you to the goodness of all the firefighters and everyone else who are working to make a difference there. But that's a good example of what evil and pain cause, but that new growth can happen in the midst, in spite of and after those types of things happen. You think of forest fires and what happens in those and how forests regrow in even more powerful ways. And that is what Christ gives us each and every day in the midst of the pain that we've experienced. So you have been created, each and every one of you, and each and every one of the people you know, and each and every one of the people we don't know, have been created to be the embodiment of the genius of Jesus Christ. What a privilege. What an honor that we are all together along with Christ, the answer to the problem of evil. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. 
the things we see, the things we don't, the things we understand, the things we don't. Your ways are above us. But we thank you for the ministry of Jesus Christ and how you showed us who you truly are and how much you love. We thank you for the opportunity we have to know that we are loved and forgiven by you and that we have the opportunity to be a part of your plan, a part of the answer to the problem of evil in this world and in this universe, that we can make a difference, that we can follow the difference that you made, that we can live today what we believe tomorrow will bring, that we have a hope, that we have a promise, that all will be made new, that all is being made new, that all has been made new because of your sacrifice. Thank you for never giving up on us. And may we never give up on you or one another. We pray these things in your name. Amen.